Welcome back to Anuvika's Take 10. I am Edward Adler's Director of Marketing for Anuvika. And as always, I'm joined by our Director of Technical Services, Alex Perkins. And today we're talking all about OVD Enterprise 3.0. It's Anuvika's latest release of our app virtualization platform. And 3.0 is our biggest release to date, and it's full of new features and enhancements that focus on the user experience and making it even better. Now, our customers tell us that OVD delivers an already great user experience, whether it's the fast application and session launches or our intuitive user modes like app mode uh, that, that integrates OVD virtualized apps onto the user's own local Mac, Windows, or Linux desktops. The OVD delivers a rich user experience that's fast and easy to use. So 3.0 now is building on that already great user experience and we're going to take a look at some of those features today, as well as in part two. So let's start by bringing in Alex Perkins again. Now, Alex, you've had a chance to work with 3.0, both in a pre-sales as well as some early customer deployments. What is the early feedback that you've heard and seen uh, with uh, 3.0? What new additions has attracted the most interest so far? Well, I think Ed, um, apart from all the, you know, some of the the smaller features, resource containers is by far the the biggest change that um, that is drawing attention to the product here. Well, let's let's start with resource container then. Now, resource container gives admins the ability to to limit or prioritize CPU and RAM resources to users or groups of users. Why is this important, and what does it mean for OVD users and admins from a quality of service point of view? Well, it's a very powerful feature that is using the same container-based technology that you'd find in services that are very common, such as Docker. Um, it allows you to limit the RAM and CPU as well as prioritize CPU on a per-user basis. You can also do this on a group basis too. To give an experience similar to a true one-to-one -one VDI, but it's in a shared desktop-based environment. It allows you to customize individuals or groups of users based on resource needs. So you could have a power user versus a, a lightweight everyday user. It can help you prevent individual users or rogue applications from hogging system resources and impacting the overall performance for the rest of the users. So it's similar to like quality of service in a, in a network design. And it very much assists the administrator in predictable sizing and user density, um, either on cloud or for on-premise infrastructure. Let's take a look, how, how does it work? Um, so basically, if I show you here in, in our demo system we've got here, um, we've got our take 10 uh, tenant, if I go through and show you my users, we have a number of different users here. Now, what I've set up is a resource policy for the C Holland and the D pool user. If we jump into the user groups, we have a number of different groups. We have our general apps, and then we've got those um, light power uh, groups, which are, are setting those limits. If we jump into light, you'll see at the bottom here that we've set resource restrictions for both the um, Linux application servers and the Windows application servers. In this instance, it's saying that the users can use no more than 400 megabytes of memory, and they've got 25% of available CPU resource. A user that is a power user, so this will be the D-Pool user, is allowed 50% of the available um, CPU resource, regardless of the operating system, and two gigabytes of available memory. Um, so for the purpose of testing this, I've logged in with both of these users, as you can see here. We're going to run a quick benchmark um, and I'll be able to show you back on the administration console how it's actually taking effect. So this tab here is the C Holland user. So I'm going to hit benchmark and this is the D pool user. I'm going to hit benchmark on here. Now you'll see it's moving around the blocks on the screen. You can see the D pool user is moving faster than the, the C Holland user. You see we're a good few squares behind that. And that is because of those CPU and memory limits that we put in place. Now, if we go and have a look back on the service tab, we'll jump into the Linux application server as that is where these applications are running from. We can go and see that the Charlotte Holland user in this instance is using just around 29% of available CPU and the Derek Paul user is allowed to use 42% of available CPU. You can also see the memory restrictions are different as well. So we've got a 400 megabyte memory limit for Charlotte Holland, but we've got a two gigabyte memory limit for Derek Paul. 
and the other two users on there are currently in a disconnected state so they're, they're using what's left of the available um, memory on there. Now we can also set uh, maximum memory that is available for the server to allocate as well. So you can guarantee a certain amount for system resources too. So this is a really powerful feature um, that as you can see, if we're gonna be sizing um, very closely uh, to a fairly dense build, you know, let's say 60, 70 users an application server, we can really crunch down um, what the users can use exactly for both CPU and RAM to get maximum bang for buck basically. So that's a resource container. Let's move on now. Next up is a really interesting one. It's hybrid Active Directory integration. Now, this is a feature that isn't necessarily obvious to the end user because it works behind the scenes, if you will, but it definitely impacts the way, for example, mixed application users can work within a Microsoft domain environment. Now, OVD works with Microsoft Active Directory or any uh, LDAP compatible directory service, but most enterprise deployments typically take place within a Microsoft Active Directory environment. Um, but there are implications to using, for example, Microsoft roaming profiles when it comes to app virtualization and specifically users of Linux applications. So Alex, um, this is a little bit complex to explain, but explain to us what hybrid AD integration does and what problem does it really fundamentally solve? Um, so ultimately, it's giving you the full benefit of Active Directory mode, but you can still use OBD to manage uh, user profiles, which historically we weren't able to do. It used to be that if you had Active Directory, the OBD file server was no longer available. You'd also lose access to Linux applications too, and a number of customizations that OBD would offer. In addition to this, it now allows you to um, use um, Windows authentication pass-through for like single sign-on based applications. You can use group policies, network shares with printers, storage, and so on. Um, it also gives administrators a pathway to migrate away from Microsoft roaming profiles. So we've got a migration tool as part of the, of the product now. And as I mentioned before, you can use Linux applications in a true Active Directory environment now. So where, where before it was one or the other, you can now have the best of both worlds and everything plays nicely. Okay. So now on the surface, this sounds pretty straightforward, but in reality, it involves quite a bit of complex engineering by our, our very talented development team. And you'd think that implementing something like that would be equally as complex, but that's not necessarily the case, is it? No, not at all. It is very, very easy to, to set this functionality up. Um, so if I just jump back into the administration console here, if we go over to the users tab, we switch into the domain integration tab. Bear in mind, I'm using the internal database uh, on our demo system here. But if I choose the Microsoft Active Directory mode, all we would need to simply do is fill in the domain, the primary host, the login and password for the domain. We would choose Active Directory user groups and we would simply go and click hybrid integration. There's nothing we have to install, nothing more we need to configure. And out of the box, you then have you know, the fantastic features that OVD can offer alongside all of the standard features that, that Microsoft Active Directory can provide you with the benefit of all those Linux applications too. So once again, uh, just like what we did with multi-tenancy, we, we make app virtualization easy and we make it easy to uh, deploy this uh, hybrid AD, AD mode. That's uh, that's great. And the next one is focused really on helping users who encounter some issues during their sessions. And it's all about uh, remote support and it's called shadowing, user shadowing. Shadowing lets OVD administrators provide remote assistance to OVD users during their session. It establishes a remote screen share session between users and admins and facilitates support if the user encounters a problem. Now, the way in which we implemented shadowing takes a few very important things into consideration. First is user consent. Now, before a user uh, a shadow session uh, can be established, users are presented with an alert notice and they must accept the request before the session can be initiated. And then second, user privacy. So OVD admins can only view the OVD related applications currently running in the user's active session. So if, for example, a user is currently in app mode, if you're familiar with app mode, uh, the user's desktop and all non OVD items will not be visible to the remote admin. So it's, it's a way to kind of protect user privacy and only the active OVD application windows will be visible. 
So Alex, uh, let's take a look at it and let's see how this, uh, this works. Sure. So looking back at the administration console here, we have three users logged in. I have Harriet Carpenter, which is a desktop mode in Windows. I have my support user, which is where I'm going to run the shadowing session from, which we'll see in a second. And then we've got T Jones, which is a portal-based session running out of the web client. Um, as Ed was saying, with application mode or portal mode, we can only see the running application rather than the whole desktop experience. So I'm going to show you how both of those work. So this is that desktop session running on Windows. This is my portal session. Um, running just as part of the web browser. And then here I've got my support session, which I've got the administration console logged in with. Now, part of the way that the security of OVD works is we only allow you to shadow from within um, either OVD or within the same network to enhance that security um, to prevent data leakage. So if we come in here, we'll look at the status and reports tab where we were on my other tab. I can go and jump into the Harriet Carpenter session here and you see I've got shadow. Um, I can shadow the desktop server because that is where all the applications will be running from. So if I go ahead here and click shadow, it's now preparing that session. I need to copy the password and then hit open remote assistance. It uses the Windows remote assistance viewer, um, which is then uh, loaded. You can pop the password in and what you see now is a black screen. So it's all about user consent. If I switch back to that desktop session, you see, would you uh, like to allow support to connect to your computer? So I'll hit yes. The session has now begun. And you can see if we move into my support session that I can now interact with that user. I can open up a chat window. I can say, hi, Harriet. Can we support you? I go and send that message. You see that's appeared up here. And then you can have a conversation with who's supporting you as well. The administrator can then request control. Um, and uh, again, coming back to consent, would you like to support to share control of your desktop? So the support user can now control the, the user's session. I could go and load up Microsoft Paint, for example, as an administrator uh, and draw. And that is now part of the session. I could go back as the user and then add to that, which the um, support user will see. So that's all very straightforward, as you can see there. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to close this support session. And I will show you um, the, the portal based experience instead. So here we've got portal, I've got paint open. Um, what I will do this time, I'm going to go into that T Jones user. You see, we've got two shadows this time. And because we haven't got a desktop server, we can choose to either shadow the Windows session or the Linux session, and we can, we can switch between the two. I'm only going to shadow the window session here. So again, I want to um, start the shadow, open remote assistance. We've already copied that password. We're going to paste the password in. And in exactly the same way, we get that pop up asking um, if we can connect to the session. So I've hit yes. That session is now available. And you'll see, as Ed said earlier, we can only see the um, user session uh, for the applications that they're actually using at that time. We don't see any of the other applications. If you're using application mode, none of the desktop experience is shared. And in exactly the same way, we can pop up the box. We can say, um, can we can we remotely support them? You know, I can go on and, and add, add additional um, uh, uh, drawing on the image there. And then we can come back and I, as a user, can also continue that, which the administrator can see. Um, but that is the basic premise of shadowing. It's very secure. It's very private. When the shadow session has been ended, everything is closed off. The user is exactly back to where they were. You know, there's no way that any data can be leaking out of the platform. Join us for part two, where we'll continue to look at the new features of OVD Enterprise 3.0. You can learn more about what you've seen here today by visiting anubica.com slash what's underscore new. And as always, you can experience OVD for yourself by requesting a free trial and demo. Thanks for joining us today.